dedicated daughter, gifted teacher, courageous leader, Mother Theodore Guerin. In 1840, leaving her home in France, she came to Indiana. She was determined to be the face of God's providence to everyone she encountered. She left a legacy of love, mercy, and justice. Who was this woman we call Saint Mother Theodore? What can we learn from her life to guide us in today's world? In 1798, the French Revolution was drawing to a close, leaving the people and the countryside devastated. Into this world, on October 2nd, a baby girl was born to Isabelle and Laurent Guérin. They named the baby Anne Thérèse and dedicated her to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Life was difficult, and the family was visited by tragedy when an older brother was lost to fire. The family found solace in their faith, and at the age of 10, Aunt Therese dedicated herself to God. She had to stand on her own when she was a child. Um, she always said that when she went down to the Breton shore, it was a place where she thought of God, and the ocean was for her the symbol of eternity. When Aunt Therese was 15, the family lost another young son, once again to fire. Then, in 1814, Monsieur Guérin died at the hands of brigands. Aunt Therese had already known much sorrow in her young life. She seemed to respond to whatever it was that happened in her life. Uh, instead of folding under it, she somehow took hold of it and integrated it in such a way that it strengthened her character. Anne Therese accepted the responsibilities of her household when she was not yet 16 years old. She yearned to follow the call to religious life, but Providence had other designs for her fulfillment. Her trust in Providence, even at that young age, guided her, and she stayed to care for her family. When Anne Therese was 24, her mother gave her blessing to the desire of her elder daughter to serve God. The Sisters of Providence at Rue sur Loire welcomed her into their religious community. Perfect abandonment of ourselves in all things requires great courage, but we ought to aspire to it. Aunt Therese took the name Sister Saint Theodore. Her superiors recognized in this new sister the gifts of leadership, compassion, and a sense of responsibility. She was appointed superior in the parish of Saint-Aubin at Rennes. Situated in a rough-and-tumble section of town, it was considered the most difficult of schools. Through the influence of Sister St. Theodore, with the children and their families, the once downtrodden area became the pride of all its people. She loved them. That was the first step. And when you love a person, you desire what is good and best. And children pick that up very quickly. They know when they're loved. And as they experience that, they open themselves to become more. Their own lives are enhanced by that expression of love. Sister St. Theodore's success in the bustling city of Rennes was not universally appreciated. Because of misunderstandings within her community, the confidence that her superior, Mother Marie Lecor, had had in her was shaken. She was reassigned to a small country school in the village of Sulen. With fewer demanding responsibilities, Sister St. Theodore devoted more time to prayer, spiritual reading, and contemplation. She also studied medicine and pharmacy to enhance her skills in caring for the sick poor. While at Sulen, Sister St. Theodore was recognized for her excellence in education with a medal presented by the Academy of Angers in France. Sister St. Theodore had had a long-time interest in foreign missions. The bishop of the Diocese of Vincennes, Indiana, Simon Gabriel Brute, sent his vicar general, Father Celestine de la Hélandière, to France to ask the Sisters of Providence to establish a religious congregation in the United States, 
dedicated to the education of children. Sister St. Theodore was 41 years old and her health was frail when she was asked to lead the mission. Even though many feared such an endeavor would imperil her life, Sister St. Theodore accepted. When I read the Bible, what struck me is the passage that says, Go then and make disciples of all nations, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what gives me the courage is that sentence that follows, I am with you always until the end of time. Sister St. Theodore and five other religious, Sister St. Vincent Ferré, Basilide, Olympiade, Marie Xavier, and Marie Ligori, left their beloved France for the unknown, the American frontier. It would be difficult to describe what passed in my soul when I felt the vessel begin to move, and I realized that I was no longer in France. It seemed as if my soul was being torn from my body. The rolling was so great that we were thrown and bruised in our beds. When the vessel leaned to the right, it drew our beds and all that was in the room to that side. Then, regaining its equilibrium, it threw us with equal violence to the left. Our dear plump sister Ligori fell against me with all her weight. I thought I was killed. Four times we lighted a candle, but it could not be kept in place. Never did we laugh so heartily as that evening. After 40 days crossing the Atlantic, they finally arrived in America. We were on the soil of America. I was so affected that I could scarce utter a word. The sights in New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore eased their transition into this foreign place. But soon enough, they had to venture westward to an untamed land. There are other beautiful sights in America, but they are a wild, uncultivated kind. We had come to suffer, and to suffer in the West. The true country of a Christian, but above all of a religious, is heaven, towards which we are tending. It is for God that we have made this sacrifice, and we cannot but recognize the attentions of his providence. Transportation to the Indiana frontier was more primitive than anything they had experienced in France. But nothing was so unsettling as their first experience on a corduroy road. The coach jolted so terribly as to cause large bumps on one's head. This day, indeed, we danced without a fiddle all afternoon. Come on, boys, yeah! It was not without danger that we were traveling, especially in the night. In fact, we had gone only six miles when the stage was upset in a deep mud hole, throwing us head foremost. When one has nothing more to lose, the heart is inaccessible to feel. The sisters had thought they were to establish their mission in Vincennes. However, de la Hollandière, having succeeded Brute as bishop, sent them farther north into wilderness to an area called St. Mary of the Woods. After a journey that had taken more than three months, on October 22, 1840, the sisters finally arrived. What they found was most discouraging. We had agreed among ourselves that a first visit would be made to the Blessed Sacrament and that we would not speak to anyone before having satisfied this longing of our hearts. The priest preceded us, and we followed in silence to the church. Oh, the church. No tabernacle, no altar. Remembering the lovely chapels of France, the sisters were stunned that such a structure served as a holy place, even in this wilderness. Mother Theodore and her sisters faced a much greater challenge in Indiana than they had ever imagined. It is astonishing that this remote solitude has been chosen for a novitiate, and especially an academy. All appearances are against it. Her eye was on the mission. She was sent here for a purpose, and she was able to overcome those feelings of probably some alienation and some fear and anxiety. 
The face of Providence revealed itself through the Thralls family, who for several weeks shared their farmhouse with the sisters and then sold it to them. Mother Theodore and her small community set to work. On July 4, 1841, less than nine months after the sisters had arrived, the first student was enrolled at St. Mary of the Woods. Her name was Mary. Other students soon followed. Mother Theodore saw in their success the intercession of the Blessed Mother. To Mother Theodore, Mary was the ultimate vessel of God's providence. Is it not admirable to see how the Blessed Virgin loves us? It is to her that we owe everything, for she is the channel through which comes all the graces that God showers upon us so profusely. During these early days of growth, differences of opinion developed between Mother Theodore and Bishop de la Hollandière, who was under great strain from the demands of his frontier diocese. Though these conflicts caused her great suffering, Mother Theodore responded to him always with humility and charity. She remained steadfast to the constitutions and rules of the Sisters of Providence. In these times of frustration, she sought advice and counsel from Bishop Bouvier and Mother Marie Lecor in France. Pray much for me, my good mother, for I have great need of it. I am not always in agreement with the good superior, for the reception of subjects, admission to the habit, and even to the vows and the undertaking of establishments. I am afraid of going too fast, and Monsignor says that in this country nothing is done slowly. The sisters at St. Mary of the Woods were pleased with American Catholics. Believers were reverent and steadfast. Children were eager to learn. The sisters' religious community grew with young women from both France and the United States. These new arrivals brought valued and necessary skills. While progress was clear, life on the frontier continued to be difficult. I have generally preserved peace of heart and even my natural gaiety. This habitual state of calm, it is true, has from time to time its tempests. I am sometimes so depressed, so disheartened, that I feel inclined to excessive sadness. Sometimes I have even felt full of love and gratitude towards God who has deigned, in spite of my sins, to grant me the grace of suffering for him. Soon, a day school was added to the sisters' mission. The academy, which in time became St. Mary of the Woods College, was taking root. The Sisters of Providence established new missions in Jasper, Vincennes, and Madison, Indiana, and in St. Francisville, Illinois. Mother Theodore maintained a close connection to all her sisters. Her deep love for her daughters of the woods was apparent through her frequent correspondence and her many trips to the sisters on mission. She shared with them the latest news, bestowed her always practical advice, and offered her love, comfort, and support. Every thought of my dear sisters in Jasper is a prayer. You are lonesome, and so are we. But of this separation, we do not complain. We cannot do our work if we all stay in the nest. Have confidence in the providence that so far has never failed us. The way is not yet clear. Grope along slowly. Do not press matters. Be patient. Be trustful. And rest assured, my dear daughters, if you lean with all your weight upon providence, you will find yourself well supported. During this time, Catholics in the United States were faced with bigotry and suspicion. In some cities, riots against Catholics broke out. Sometimes I am so disheartened with this country that I feel as if I were carrying on my shoulders the weight of its highest mountains and in my heart all the thorns of its wilderness. She never beautified the cross. She always said, I wish I didn't have it. I don't really like it, but I want to accept it because it is something that I know will draw me closer and closer to God. The harvest of 1842 was plentiful. On October 2nd, Mother Theodore's birthday and the anniversary of the death of her young brother, fire broke out in the granary at St. Mary of the Woods. The community lost everything. 
including its entire winter stock of flour, feed for the livestock, and all its farming implements. It was suspected that the fire had been intentionally set. These were the darkest days since their arrival in the United States, yet Mother Theodore accepted these trials as part of the Christian mystery of dying and resurrection. She said, the only thing you can do is throw your cares on providence, and there's nothing you can do about it. You simply have to let it go. If ever this poor little community becomes settled, it will be established on the cross. And that gives me confidence and makes me hope, sometimes even against hope. After spending a long and very difficult winter in Indiana, Mother Theodore realized St. Mary of the Woods needed help. The fire had left the community impoverished, and though the bishop did all he could for the Church of Vincennes, his personality and his vision of religious life created difficulties. The sisters were without the resources needed to continue their mission. So, in the summer of 1843, Mother Theodore returned to her beloved France, seeking advice and financial help. At times disheartened, she was fortunate in arranging a meeting with Marie-Amélie, Queen of France. Queen Marie-Amélie continued to speak with touching kindness of all that might contribute to the welfare of our work. In a moment of holy exaltation, she said, Oh yes, sisters, let us save souls. While Mother Theodore would have liked to stay longer in France, she was concerned about her fledgling community of sisters in Indiana. Without delay, she embarked for the United States. This time it was a winter crossing, fraught with treacherous seas. We assembled together for prayer and had offered anew to our dying Savior the sacrifice of our lives. The storm raged horribly, the whole time nevertheless. In the midst of a storm, how sweet is the calm one finds in the heart of Jesus. Through the intercession of St. Anne, the patroness of Breton sailors, Mother Theodore safely arrived at New Orleans. She immediately fell seriously ill and hovered near death. Regaining some strength after seven weeks, she resumed her journey up the Mississippi to return to the land that had truly become her home. The farther north we went, the lower the temperature and bleaker the landscape. This severe change was sweet to me, for it meant I was nearing home. Finally, on the fifth day, with inexpressible joy, I saw once more my Indiana. This land was no longer for me the land of exile. It was the portion of my inheritance, and in it I hoped to dwell all the days of my life. After almost a year of separation, she was reunited with her sisters. Imagine our feelings when, with emotion too deep for words, we went to kneel before him to whom we owed all our happiness. In gratitude to St. Anne, a chapel was built in her honor at St. Mary of the Woods. In Mother Theodore's absence, problems with Bishop de la Hollandière had intensified. He had ignored the sisters' constitutions and rules. Even though the female seminary of St. Mary of the Woods had been incorporated in the state, the diocese retained ownership to the property upon which the mother house and academy had been built— the community considered moving away from Indiana. Let us take courage, my very dear sisters. The cross, it is true, awaits us at every turn, but it is the way to heaven. Mother Theodore traveled to Vincennes to address grievances with Bishop de la Hollandière. On this occasion, the bishop asked her to resign. She agreed to do so only if her community wished it. The bishop responded with anger. He locked her in a room and rescinded her title of superior general. He released her from her vows and banished her from the diocese. He forbade any communication with her sisters. She became extremely ill and was, once again, near death. I was occupied only with preparing myself for death, which I believed was not far away. But I was mistaken. Without doubt, I was not ripe for heaven. 
As Mother Theodore lay ill, word came that the Pope had accepted the resignation of Bishop de la Hollandière. Perhaps now the years of trial were at an end. In fact, the newly appointed bishop, Jean-Étienne Bazin, and the bishops who were to follow him provided Mother Theodore and her sisters with benevolent support and assistance. The tribulations which have affected our community have produced very precious fruits. All our establishments are progressing. Trust in God's providence does not mean that we sit back and let God take care of everything. It means that we trust God that if we work together with God's help, we can help transform the world into a kingdom of peace and justice and love. That's the, the whole purpose of are being present in God's place. Life in Indiana remained hard, but through every tribulation, Mother Theodore lovingly looked after both the physical and spiritual well-being of her dear sisters. My beloved sisters, if you have not sufficient flour, empty the sacks and send the remainder of the wheat to the mill. All who have not put on heavy underwear must do so at once. My very dear and beloved daughters, just this moment I hear that the cholera has made its entrance into your dear Madison. I cannot tell you how anxious I am about you. Do not fast. Let your food be wholesome and well prepared. Keep yourselves ready to answer the summons of your divine spouse if he calls you to himself. Like the caring mother of Jesus she always emulated, Mother Theodore truly loved her daughters. The name Mother is not given in vain. Could I forget what you are to me? Be assured once for all, no one will love you as your old Mother Theodore does. Mother Theodore believed that all people were created in God's image. She encouraged her sisters to act always in loving and just ways. As a businesswoman, she asserted her right to be treated fairly under the law. It embarrasses them a little to have women resist them and speak to them about the law. Woman in this country is only yet one-fourth of the family. I hope that through the influence of religion and education, she will eventually become at least one half, the better half. The Sisters of Providence proceeded to establish schools throughout the Diocese of Vincennes, Fort Wayne and Terre Haute, Evansville and North Madison. Notwithstanding the losses we have sustained, we are 50 sisters in the religious habit. Besides these, we have 15 postulants. We have no new missions except the boys' asylum. But all our houses are completely supplied. Mother Theodore's frail health continued to plague her and caused the sisters great concern. Repeatedly, the hardships she willingly accepted as God's providence had been overwhelmed by her commitment to follow the will of God wherever it led. For her 16 years in America, her strong spirit overcame ill health, duplicity, betrayal, and bigotry. On May 14, 1856, after a lingering illness, Mother Theodore Guerin died. She had spent herself to bring God's loving care to the new world. Having done so, she entered a life of total union with the God whom she had served so well. Mother Theodore's legacy grew in missions throughout the United States, around the world, and in the hearts of everyone her sisters taught, cared for, or touched. I have never thought of Mother Theodore as someone who has died because her spirit is so alive in us. The mission that she came to accomplish is so vibrant that even though the grain of wheat that was her life did die, it's still bringing forth great fruit. If at any day we accomplish some good here, the glory will certainly be his alone, since he has employed for this end instruments more capable of spoiling everything than of making it succeed. What does it matter what becomes of us, provided God's work be accomplished? Her total dependence on this provident God can be a tremendous gift to us in the sense that this provident God can make something good and wonderful 
out of some of the most difficult and horrendous circumstances of our lives. And now the world shares in the legacy of Mother Theodore. On October 25, 1998, thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square in Vatican City as Pope John Paul II presided at the ceremony of beatification. The Roman Catholic Church proclaimed Mother Theodore blessed, offering her as a model for all people who aspire to live a good life. Her feast day will be celebrated each year on October 3rd. The whole world may now come to know her as a woman who lived her life with extraordinary holiness. Pope John Paul II say her life was a perfect blend of humanness and holiness. She did very small, ordinary things in an extraordinary way. Eight years later, on October 15, 2006, the bells in St. Peter's Square again rang out, calling pilgrims gathered from all over the world to the canonization ceremony of four blesseds, among them Mother Theodore Guerin. Pope Benedict XVI presided and spoke of her as a beautiful spiritual figure and a model of the Christian life. Mother Theodore Guerin entered the congregation of the Sisters of Providence in 1823. The legacy of this saint of God, this woman for all time, lives on in the Sisters of Providence of St. Mary of the Woods and in the many volunteers, associates, and benefactors who partner with them in honoring divine providence and furthering God's loving plans by devoting themselves to love, mercy, and justice in service among God's people. I sleep, but my heart watches over this house which I have built. Ours is a preparation for the generation that will succeed us, and eminent good will be done this way by us. You may not live to see it, but you will have sown the seed, and your sisters will come to reap what will have been sown. What have we to do to become saints? Nothing extraordinary, nothing more than we do every day, only to do it all purely for His love. We are not called upon to do all the good possible, but only that which we can do. O oh my God, grant that all who dwell in this house may love you much, love one another, and never forget why they came here. Grants that one day they may all be reunited in heaven.